to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hey everybody, welcome to the end of our three-part nootropic series, and as you can guess by the title and other context clues, the topic of today's video is Selang, another heptapeptide that came out of Russia, in particular at the Institute of Molecular Genetics at the Russian Academy of Sciences alongside the V.V. Zakuzov Research Institute of Pharmacology at the Russian Academy of Medical Sciences. And although it's frequently discussed in the context of Simax, it's in fact quite different. If you can recall, the structure of Simax is based off of a fragment of ACTH, or adrenocorticotropic hormone. Meanwhile, Selang is analogous to a compound called Tufsin, and is thought to be involved in processes that decrease severity of anxiety, affect mood, and counter substance-induced neurotoxicity and withdrawal symptoms. Like with Simax, we've done some previous videos on Selang, however, we'll do a quick review and then segue into the nootropic details. And if you are still there, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button, best way to support me, thanks in advance. So just like Simax and Cerebral Lysin are thought to operate via increased expression of these restorative neurotrophic factors, that is unsurprisingly a similar idea behind how Selang operates, and also similarly not too well explicated and explored. And there exists such a claim that Selang regulates expression of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and as we also said before, these neurotrophic factors are of interest to researchers and clinicians because they highlight that the brain may be able to regulate restorative properties like neurogenesis and synaptogenesis in a way that prior to the 1950s we didn't really think was possible. But let's back up a little. Why would a peptide be created to resemble Tufsin? So, Tufsin is a tetrapeptide isolated in the 1970s by researchers at, of course, Tufts University in Massachusetts. And endogenously, Tufsin is an immunomodulatory peptide. And although its endogenous mechanism of action isn't fully understood, we know that it is a fragment of the heavy chain of immunoglobulin G and quite possibly influences different functions of the inflammatory response. Some other roles thought to be influenced by Tufsin include regulation of tumor growth, bone marrow, stimulation of red blood cell production, and the levels of present neurotransmitters like dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Now, also interestingly, the structure of Selang is essentially the tetrapeptide structure of Tufsin, plus three amino acids, proline, glycine, followed by a proline, added onto its C-terminus. I don't know if you remember this from the Simax video, but in development of Simax, the amino acid residues proline followed by glycine followed by proline, the same structure, showed the longest acting activity and thus to prolong the half-life of Selang, this same structure is attached at the end to increase its metabolic stability and duration of action. Now, the human research is minimal. However, there has been a decent body of animal-derived data presenting the compound as an anxiolytic. That said, whether or not we can determine if that is translational to humans, that's another conversation to be had. And it also appears that cognition and memory processes have been looked at in some data as well, so that's what we'll investigate here. And contrary to cerebral license, Selang has a lot less research on this topic, among others, especially in humans. And to be frank, with regards to the proposed and sometimes claimed nootropic activity of Selang, I can't really find much. So let it be known that research behind the idea that Selang will make you smarter and more cognitively adept is by no means robust. There was a trial in rats where injection of Selang appeared to activate metabolism of serotonin and increased memory trace stability in food reward tasks for 30 days duration. There was another study where rats were neonatally injected with Selang and a neurotoxin that artificially damaged neurons responsible for production of catecholamines. And it showed that the use of the peptide helped restore cognitive processes affected by disordered neurotransmitter production. There's also minimal data to suggest that Selang would characteristically regulate or increase BDNF expression. There was a study that took place in rodents where some consumed only 10% ethanol for 30 weeks, which is essentially a booze-only diet. In the rodents that didn't, it seemed that Selang administration had a bit of a cognitive boosting effect. In the alcohol consumers, it did seem to mitigate some of the memory and attention disturbances in rats going through withdrawal. And on top of that, the peptide in this study appeared to counteract the rise in BDNF in the frontal cortex and hippocampus of rats that were subjected to the alcohol. 
In animal studies, chronic alcohol intake has shown that it may stimulate increased BDNF expression in different brain areas, which could also correlate with more episodes of withdrawal. And although interesting and possibly in the future may shine a light on use of peptide and alcohol use and its dependence, from a nootropic standpoint, given the research we have currently, it's by no means adequate enough for me to be convinced. Yes, Solanc may in some way modulate BDNF. However, it's inconclusive as we've only collected minimal data on rats under the influence of alcohol, and something that if we were to make this claim would need to be further investigated. As we've explained previously, increasing expression of these different neurotrophic factors, although unconfirmed, could affect cognition, memory, brain health in general. And thus, a lot of the data assessing these different more quote-unquote nootropic peptides seeks to evaluate that concept. However, in this case, it's very minimal. I'm personally more interested in the research behind the compound's role as a possible anxiolytic or an enhancement of other anti-anxiety drugs through its utilization. There's only one clinical trial in humans I can find, and it's just the abstract, a study that came out of Russia about 15 years ago, where 62 patients with generalized anxiety disorder, GAD, were assessed. 30 were given Solanc, 32 were given a benzodiazepine, and it appeared that observations with regards to effects on anxiety were similar. However, Solanc additionally favored anti-asthenic effects, which means that it may have improved feelings of general weakness or lack of energy and strength, and it also exhibited some stimulating properties. Now, we've got pretty much zero to no data in humans, nothing that assesses safety risks, metrics of cognitive function, and although it's stated to be used in Russia, the amount of data you'd expect for something utilized in clinical practice is sparse. This is just my take on Solanc as a nootropic, guided by the research. All in all, I hope you enjoyed this video series. I'm considering making a final video comparing side by side the three we had discussed over the past couple weeks, so let me know if that's something you'd be interested in. Regardless, if you found this helpful, educational, informative, perhaps it didn't put you to sleep, in which case, please give us a thumbs up. If you dislike the video, give us a thumbs down. But most importantly, thank you for your time. I hope you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.